This video is sponsored by Coursera. There are various problems and tasks in the world that are very hard to solve through just programming computer through traditional methods and explicit instructions. Making computer games, iPhone apps, or desktop applications are very doable through normal means. Whereas making a machine that can beat the best human in a complex game, making a car that can drive itself, or having a computer recognize objects are not so simple. These are not things you can easily just tell a computer to do. One way around this is telling the computer how to learn and having it figure out how to get better through lots of practice, or in a computer's case, lots of data. This is machine learning. Machine learning helps Amazon suggest relevant products for you. It's used to read handwritten addresses when you send a letter. It's used to figure out whether an email is spam or not. It's used to demonetize your favorite videos across this entire platform. And it's used for a few other things. In order to make this possible, we need to combine a lot of math with a lot of programming. So let's see how all that works. The main types of math you're gonna see in an intro machine learning course are these right here, but even if you don't know any of them, you'll still be fine for this video. So let's say you wanna make an algorithm for a real estate site that can estimate the market price of a house. First, we're gonna need some data, maybe from another realty site so the algorithm can learn from it. For simplicity, we're only going to include one variable as an input parameter, the size of the house in square feet in our case. And the goal is if we give it a new input value, it will output an accurate price. Well, let's plot this data to see what it looks like. I'm just gonna treat the axes as one digit numbers to avoid any large values here. Now, obviously this has a linear look to it, which means we can estimate this with a best fit line. I'm sure this is not anything new to most of you guys, but where we're going with this probably isn't exactly what you're thinking. First off, let's guess a best fit line with let's say y equals x. And by the way, we're gonna fix this line at the origin for this entire part. So all we can change is the slope. Of course, this first guess is not the best fit line, but why is that? Well, we see at a size of 1,000 square feet, our line guesses $100,000 when it should be $150,000. Therefore, the error is 50K, but with the reduced values, you see it's just 0.5, which I'll put up here. When the size is 2,000 square feet, our line has a prediction error of two. And we can figure this out for everything. Before moving on, what we're gonna do is square all of those errors. This is simply because we don't care about whether our prediction is too low or too high. Error is error, so we just want the positive values to see how truly, quote, off our line is. We could do the absolute value, I guess, but that's not what's used in practice. If we add up all those errors, we get 26.125. So if we had a plot of the error versus that slope value that we guessed, then we can plot that a slope of one, while fixing the origin, gets us an error of 26.125. If we increase the slope to 1.25 to get a closer match, we can again calculate those errors, add them up, and get a new and lower total error value. And we can then put that on our error plot. A slope of 1.68 gives us a total error of 1.327, and we can do this for several other slopes to create a parabolic error function. And now this tells us that right here is the slope of our best fit line because it yields a minimum error. Now let's go back to that first guess we made. We obviously knew this underestimated everything and slope needed to be increased. But how would a computer know which direction to go? Well, here's an algorithm to figure it out. The new slope will be the old slope minus a constant times the derivative of the error function at that point. For those who don't know calculus, that's okay. Right now we're guessing a slope of one for the best fit line. So if we pull up our error function, we remember that a slope of one gave us an error of about 26 when we added everything up. At this value, we need the slope of the tangent line now. It's clearly negative, and I'll just make up a number and say it's negative 10. So the algorithm says the new slope equals the current one we're guessing of one, minus a constant, which I'll just call 0.01, times that slope or derivative. This yields a value of 1.1, and if we move our dot to that slope, we are now a little closer to that best fit line of minimum error. We're slowly stepping to our goal. We then repeat the process. The tangent line here may have a slope of negative nine, and thus the algorithm tells us the new slope is the current one minus that constant times the derivative. Again, we have inched closer to that minimum value. If we continue this, we will find that minimum error and thus the slope of our best fit line. This is called gradient descent, an optimization method to find the minimum of a function. Real quick, I know plenty of you are thinking, wait, there are known equations out there that calculate a best fit line. Why not just throw that into the program? And well, you're right. 
This is just linear regression, which you learn in many algebra classes, and that's probably better for this. But we have to introduce gradient descent simply first, because it gives you an idea of a program learning and fixing its error without explicitly being given a formula. Although that's not needed so much now, we will soon come across methods in which there's no formula that will help and no way a person could just look and figure out how an initial guess and parameters should be changed. Now, we've only done the math with a single parameter, just changing the slope of our best fit line. But adding more really does not change much. Let's say now we want to make a real best fit line and include the y-intercept parameter. Well, we could make a guess for both and plot that against our original data, calculate all those errors, and make another plot of the error. The only difference is now the error would be a function of the slope we guessed and the y-intercept we guessed, meaning we would have a 3D plot of the error. If our error started here, the goal is again to walk down the curve until you reach a minimum and can get a corresponding slope and y-intercept, aka a best fit line. Remember before how the algorithm was finding the derivative and taking a step in the right direction to go a little downhill? The only difference now is we take a partial derivative since there are more variables. This will step our slope towards that best fit line. Then we do the same thing for the y-intercept and this will step that value towards that of the best fit line. For those who don't know this yet, that's okay. Let's say this is our 3D error function plotted against slope and the y-intercept. What we're really doing is slicing the curve with a sheet parallel to one of the axes. Now this tells us which way to step in just the x direction, aka whether to increase or decrease slope alone. We're really turning this back into a 2D problem. Then we do the same with a slice in the y direction to step our y-intercept value towards a minimum. So essentially we work with both variables and keep altering them together, resulting in a walk down the hill towards a minimum. Now in the real world, in order to predict the market price of a house, there's much more to it. You may have inputs like the size of the house, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, its age, and plenty more. In order to make a best fit linear model to this, we now need more parameters. But again, we just take a guess and then run all those partial derivatives or take those slices in higher dimensions and step each one a little downhill towards a minimum. Even though this would yield a six dimensional error plot, we still break it down to a two dimensional problem for each parameter. If you go back to having one input parameter but want a more complex equation like with quadratic or cubic terms here, you just make new inputs that include the original input squared, cubed, and so on. But the math and algorithm works the same from here. So that covers making a best fit curve to approximate data regardless of how many inputs we have, but now let's mix it up. What if now we want to predict an output that can only assume two binary values, like whether someone passed or failed a test, whether a structure will break or not, or whether someone will develop a certain disease or not? Let's say we have some data on how many hours various students studied and whether they pass a certain test or not. We'll say a 1 is passing and a 0 is failing. So maybe someone studied 0 hours and failed, another studied 1 hour and failed, 2 hours and passed, and we'll put a few more for 3, 4, and 5 hours. Now the question is how do we make a program where we tell it someone studied maybe 3.5 hours or whatever, and it will tell us the probability of that person passing? Well what if we made a best fit line? There's actually some validity to doing this. We could say when the line reaches a value of 0.5, then that's a 50-50 chance they pass or fail. And this could be our boundary between likely passing or likely failing. But the problem is if we add another data point way over here, that does not exactly change much. We'd expect someone who studied this long would pass. But when included, it really affects our best fit line, making that boundary higher than it should be. So let's try something else then. We know the probability of passing or failing will only be between 0 or 1 or 0 and 100%. So let's look at a function that only exists between 0 and 1. This is known as the sigmoid function, and this is its equation. Now, although our line from before has values way above 1, if we plug those y values into the sigmoid function, it will output only numbers between 0 and 1. So the x-axis here will be the y values from our prediction line, and our real goal now is again to find a line but this time one that minimizes the error between the actual output of 1 or 0 versus what the sigmoid function spits out when we plug in the y values of that line. Here's what I mean. At an input of 0 hours, this line has a y value of 0, so that will go on our x-axis. At 1 hour, the line has a value of 0.2, so we put that on the x-axis at x equals 0.2. At 2 hours, the y value is 0.4, which we put on our graph, and we do the same thing for 3, 4, and 5 hours. 
So those are when we input into the sigmoid function. If we put in x equals 0, then it will spit out 0.5, which is evident by the graph. At zero hours of studying, we know the person failed though, so the actual output is zero, which I'll also graph. When we input 0.2, we just go up to the sigmoid function, which has an output value of 0.55, and the actual output is still zero because this person failed. And 0.4 goes up to a value of 0.6, which was actually a pass, and we do the same thing for three, four, and five. The difference between the sigmoid output and the actual output is our error, and this is what we're trying to minimize. Now notice that if we just change the y-intercept of our line, all its y-values go up by the same amount. This means on our sigmoid graph, all the x-values would increase by the same amount, moving all the dots along the curve to the right, decreasing certain errors, but increasing others. If I just change the slope instead, then the y-value at x equals zero does not change at all. The y-value at x equals one went up a little, which will shift the dot just a little along our curve. The y value at x equals 2 changed a little more, meaning that will shift further up our curve. Each term after then changed a little more than the previous, so they all move up the curve, but everything gets a little further apart. So we can move everything the same amount to the right or left by changing our line's intercept, or we can move the dots at different intervals along the curve, bunching or separating them, which happens when we alter the slope. There is some line then where we reach the sweet spot of having that minimum error. Using similar techniques to what we saw earlier, we find the line that accomplishes this has this equation. Now if someone studies 3.5 hours, we just plug that in for x, and the equation outputs 1.2139. This doesn't mean much numerically, but the point of all of this was getting a line such that when we plug the y values of the line into the sigmoid function, then we get a reasonable percent output. If we plug this value into the sigmoid function, it spits out 0.77, which means we can say that if you study 3.5 hours, then you have a 77% chance of passing the test based on results of past students. And hopefully this gives you the tiniest hint at why things like Netflix give a percent match for TV shows and movies, or why doctors may say there's some percent chance of a patient having a certain disease. And just for fun, let's run through a quick example with lots of inputs where we definitely need a program to do the work for us. Let's say whether you get into college is dependent on two exams that are both out of 100. So those are our inputs. The goal is, based on other students' scores and whether they got accepted, we want to predict the odds of us getting in with a certain set of scores. So I have all the data here which I'm going to import into Octave and graph. Okay, so here we have a plot of all the data where you can see exam one scores here and exam two scores here and people got admitted are represented by pluses and those not admitted by these yellow circles. So this is just the graph, but now the question is, let's say someone gets a 45 on exam one and a 70 on exam two. What's their percent chance of getting accepted into this college based on how everyone else did? Well, now I have to implement the algorithm to find that curve which yields the minimum error based on that sigmoid function graph. And that took three hours. I think I'll just edit out all the mistakes I made. Now I've got what I need, but first I wanna show you that this plot is technically a three-dimensional one, which I don't wanna show exactly. But what I can plot is a contour line here. And this contour line shows, in this case, exactly when someone has a 50% chance of getting in. So if you land on this line, like if you got a 92 on exam one, but only a 30 on exam two, then this means you have a 50% chance of getting in. But now if I want to see someone's odds of getting in based on the scores that they got, I just type that in and it will spit out the percent chance. So now you can see if someone got a 45 on the first exam and a 70 on the second one, then they have about a 14.5% chance of getting into the school based on how other people did. And I'll type in just a few more data points so you can see all the numbers. And here you can see these first exam scores and the second ones and then what their chance of getting in based on the scores is. You can really just ignore these ones here. Now we've seen a lot of linear models, but if you're a math person, the word linear really doesn't elicit much of an interest unless it's preceded by non. And that's where neural networks come in. These are a very non-linear and powerful technique within machine learning. A neural network may look like this, and as always, you have to give it information. Maybe that's amount of hours you studied, amount of sleep you got the night before a test, what you got on the previous test, and so on. And the goal is to use those to predict how you'll do on the next test, which should be the output. 
Well, we give the program some input values from previous data, and then weights are assigned to all those connections. Those weights multiply the inputs, and those are all added together to create new values here. Those are then multiplied by another set of weights, giving us what is supposed to be a final score of 0 to 100, let's say, the predicted value of a test. When that guess is wrong, most likely, then you backpropagate through the network and change the weights just a little to fix the error, and this is how the network learns. These weights are represented through various matrices, and those are what are altered throughout the program. There's much more to these, but due to time for this video, I'm not going to dive into it. I might do a part two video, but you can learn all of this through a machine learning course on Coursera, which is where I got all the information for this video. In this course put on by Stanford, you'll learn the math and theory behind machine learning, and you'll also be putting that all into practice in MATLAB or Octave, which they'll show you how to do. By the end of week three, you'll program the algorithm I showed you, and by week four, you'll make a neural network. They cover so much more than what I went over, and you don't even need to know calculus or linear algebra to get started. They'll explain everything you need. Coursera has thousands of other courses put on by industry leaders, so if you're looking to get ahead for the next semester, if you're trying to learn a new skill for your job, or you just want to learn something new, then I highly recommend them, and you can get started for free right now. Links are in the description below, and with that, I will end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything, and I'll see you all in the next video.